Samantha Gurumuthi with BBC World News, our top stories. Nigeria is set to be declared free of the deadly Ebola virus after eight deaths, including that of the doctor who identified the first case. By identifying the index patient, um, you know, it really helped um, Nigeria to prepare and get ready to, you know, to trace everybody. The Kurdish defenders of the Syrian town of Kobani say U.S. airdrops of weapons and supplies will greatly help their fight against Islamic State militants. Joko Widodo is sworn in as Indonesia's new president, its first leader not from the country's military or political elite. Also coming up, why some residents in the wealthy, mainly white suburbs of America's Baton Rouge are campaigning to cut ties with their poor black neighbours. Hello. Nigeria is due to be declared free of Ebola today by the World Health Organization. Just 20 cases have occurred there, with eight people dying and no new infections reported in the past six weeks. Another West African nation, Senegal, was given the all clear on Friday after the recovery of the one infected person there. While some other developments to bring you, the Spanish nurse Teresa Romero, who was the first person infected with Ebola outside West Africa, has now tested negative for the disease. She'll need a second test to confirm that she no longer carries the virus. A 21-day incubation period for the family of a U.S. Ebola victim is ending. And the British nurse, William Pooley, who was infected with the virus, has returned to Sierra Leone to continue working with Ebola patients after being successfully treated. But the crisis continues in Sierra Leone, Liberia and Guinea, where over 4,500 people have died. Will Ross reports from Lagos. The hospital that was thrust onto the front line of the fight against Ebola when the Liberian Patrick Sawyer flew into Nigeria in July. Doctors here say the highly infectious Mr Sawyer wanted to leave and became aggressive, even pulling out an intravenous drip and splashing blood on the staff. But the hospital staff stood firm. The only way we could be sure and live up to our responsibility to our people, the state and nation, this is all about patriotism at the end of it, was to keep him here. Mr Sawyer died in the hospital. Had he been let out into the vast, crowded city, Lagos, the consequences could have been catastrophic. Four of the hospital staff died trying to treat Mr Sawyer, including the heroic doctor who made the initial diagnosis. It was Nigeria's first case of Ebola. Dr Ameo Adedevo's only child is mourning but full of pride. By identifying the index patient um, you know it really helped um, Nigeria to prepare and get ready to you know to trace everybody and I think that's you know probably the difference between us and um, our West African neighbors Guinea, Liberia and Sierra Leone. Nigeria had to act fast health workers and volunteers went knocking on the doors of almost 900 people who may have come into contact with the virus their temperatures had to be taken for three weeks it was difficult work, and at times they had to convince scared medical staff to comply. You're a health worker, I'm a health worker. We understand this thing, let's just do our job. So she said, all right, so how many days would you come and check up on me? I said, 21 days. So, and when we were done, she said, you need to take me to a party. Now that I'm free from Ebola, we need to go and celebrate this. <laughs> Nigeria was unprepared, but with international support, got its act together, and the number of Ebola deaths was limited to eight. The ward behind me is where the confirmed patients were treated. It's completely empty now. This whole area is pretty much silent. The medical staff and this whole facility are on standby. Everybody's hoping and praying that Ebola doesn't come back to Nigeria. According to this expert who's helped fight several Ebola outbreaks, Nigerians must not be complacent. The sheer size of this country makes it likely that they're going to get more cases. And the second thing is an a much more average hospital environment will be slower to diagnose this disease and they will have worse infection control facilities at their disposal. Nigeria has a window of opportunity now to get better prepared right across this vast country. Another Ebola battle might be much harder to win.
Well, I spoke to Will Ross a little earlier. He explained a little bit more about how the authorities in Nigeria have managed to do so well containing Ebola so far. The key was the fact that this uh, index patient, the first man to come into Nigeria uh, with Ebola, came through the airport, so much easier to trace, and he was then into a pretty well-run hospital. So that was the key, isolating him. Um, then an awful lot of work had to be done, and I think that's the part where people are saying, you know, lessons can be learnt from Nigeria. Um, all those hundreds of, of people who were, who were traced and then convinced by a, a very dedicated team of health workers, um, convinced that they're better off complying, they're better off uh, letting these people come and take their temperatures every day so that uh, not only they're safe, but they can also help together prevent the spread of the virus. So it was a coming together of international organizations and, very importantly, different parts of the Nigerian security apparatus as well as the state and federal governments, often there at loggerheads, but on this particular issue they came together to fight it together. And what is the country now doing to prepare for any future cases? Because obviously the more numbers there are in West Africa, the more likely is that many countries will see future cases, unfortunately. Well, I've seen teams of health workers go out to, uh, to try and um, improve the, the capability of, of the clinics and the different health centres around the country. So there's that going on. Whether it's being done on the right kind of scale isn't clear. Um, there's also a lot of um, um, preparedness going on with social media, but as you say, the, the, the issue is if another case comes back, um, the, the worry is if it didn't come into a, a very well-run clinic here in Lagos, and it was maybe in a, in a more rural part of the country, if the diagnosis wasn't done fast, it could be a very, very different outcome. And as we heard in that piece, the experts are saying it's highly likely another case will come. So there is still a lot of work to be done and people are wondering, for example, in, in, in states far away from Lagos, if there was an Ebola case, how would those states respond? Because Lagos has certainly done very well, but uh, the whole country, is it ready? Many question marks still remain. Will Ross there in Lagos. Now, U.S. military aircraft have airdropped supplies to Kurdish forces fighting Islamic State militants near the Syrian border with Turkey. Planes delivered weapons, ammunition and medical supplies to the troops near Kambani, where U.S. forces have carried out 135 airstrikes against the Islamic State group in recent weeks. A Kurdish spokesman said the supplies would have a positive impact on their military operations. Neha Batnaga has details. For weeks, Kobani has been the center of battle between Kurdish fighters backed by US-led airstrikes and Islamic State militants. The fight for this important Syrian town is looked upon as a key test of President Obama's strategy against the so-called Islamic State. Syrian opposition activists say on Sunday the militants fired at least four mortar shells on the town and sporadic gunfire could be heard clashes, fierce clashes between uh, the, uh, the terrorist groups of ISIS and uh, the uh, People Protection Units uh, of YPG, the defender of Kobani. Uh, they bomb, the ISIS uh, groups uh, have been attacking Kobani for uh, about 34 days now using uh, tanks, cannons. Uh, the U.S. forces have reportedly increased their airstrikes against IS in Kobani. And now, in an apparent change of strategy, U.S. military aircraft carried out airdrops. A statement issued by U.S. Central Command said the aircraft delivered weapons, ammunition and medical supplies that were provided by Kurdish authorities in Iraq. The question is how Turkey, a key U.S. ally, will react to this. Its border is just over a kilometer from Kobani. Turkey has resisted calls to help the Kurds fighting in Kobani, describing them as terrorists like Islamic State. The Democratic Union Party is for us equal to the PKK, the Kurdistan Workers' Party. It is also a terror organization. It would be wrong for the United States, with whom we are friends and allies in NATO, to talk openly and to expect us to say yes to such a support to a terrorist organization. We can't say yes to it. It is not clear if Turkey was notified of the U.S. plan to make airdrops. 
They are believed to be the first of their kind and are being considered a significant move by the U.S. Neha Bhatnagar, BBC News. Indonesia's Joko Widodo has been sworn in as president of the world's third largest democracy. He is the first president not to belong to the established military political elite linked to the formal dictator, General Suharto. After his inauguration, he was fated by a massive street party organized by scores of young volunteers who helped catapult him into power. The BBC's Krishma Vaswani was among them. Thousands of people have come out onto the main boulevard of central Jakarta today to see their next president. Joko Widodo was inaugurated as Indonesia's seventh president this Monday, and he's actually coming through this crowd right now. You can see how everybody is so eager and keen to get a shot of him. Everyone's got their camera phones out. The crowd is, is going it's going quite wild, actually. The atmosphere here is pretty amazing. It's, it's not like anything I've ever seen before. People here are really fond of Joko Widodo. He's seen as a man of the people, and that's why the volunteers who organized this event said that they wanted a people's party to greet their new president. But Mr. Widodo will have some very tough challenges to face when he gets into office. He's inheriting a slowing economy. And he's also got to deal with an antagonistic parliament. His party only controls around a third of the seats in power. But for today, celebrations are ongoing and people are experiencing what it feels like to have the man that they chose get into power. Krishma Vaswani there in Jakarta. In Japan, two members of the cabinet, both women, have resigned because of claims that they misused campaign funds. The Justice Minister, Midori Matsushima, and the Trade and Industry Minister, Yuko Obuchi, stepped down within hours of each other. The resignations are a major setback for the Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe, who'd sought to bring more women into the top levels of government. Political support groups working for Ms. Obuchi are accused of spending hundreds of thousands of dollars of donations on theatre tickets and goods, including design and accessories. It's outrageous, isn't it? Aaron is here. You can tell <laughs> it sounds like you, Gita. Accessories. It is. Actually, I don't have the time. I've just I've been okay, reminded sorry. we're going to go. Strikes. Lufthansa again. Let me explain. Thanks very much, Gita. Yeah, Lufthansa has cancelled uh, more than 1,000 flights. Uh, that's after its pilots' union has called for a, a two-day strike. That is starting today. The dispute, it's the same one. It continues over this uh, retirement rights. More than 200,000 passengers and two-thirds of its scheduled flights, mostly within Europe, are set to be affected by the strike. Now, the union, though, has also extended that strike to cover long-haul flights, and that kicks in from tomorrow, Tuesday. Today's strike with Lufthansa, the eighth pilot strike this year. We're going to keep across all of that for you. Now, how about this? It's your mobile wallet. Yes, convenient and secure. That is just some of the buzz surrounding the launch on the new Apple Pay system that rolls out in the United States today. But will it be an overnight success? Hmm, not necessarily, because some stumbling blocks include the fact that the service will only work on new iPhone 6 model, so you need a new one. And only a fraction of the 6 million stores in the United States have signed up to it. Also, corporate store cards and loyalty cards will not be accepted. We're going to be getting more on this from one of our regular tech gurus coming up on the World Business Report in uh, just over 15 minutes' time. Also, traders, they are bracing themselves. Tell you what, another crazy week of crazy gyrations on the global financial markets. Today, we've seen shares in Asia. They rose dramatically. In fact, the main market in Japan, the Nikkei, up almost 4%. Should we go and take a look at the, uh, at the market boards? Because I've got to tell you, it's like the stock market needs to see a therapist. Why? Well, it's temperamental. It's flighty. It's prone to violent mood swings. You'll know last week the market took investors on a wild ride. Because on the downside, investors are looking at plunging oil prices. Signs of a European slowdown, a China slowdown, Ebola. But on the upside, strong company results or earnings and reassuring job market figures. And that is confusing those investors out there. You can see the European markets right now certainly not following what the US did on Friday and what Asia did this morning. They are down. That's it with the business. Gita, World Business Report coming up very shortly. Thank you very much. Talking of therapists, that's Aaron. Thanks very much indeed. Stay with us here on BBC World News. Much more to come. Is this evidence of suspicious...